What's up, everyone? MCI ADP Studios, Jay Ingersoll here, well, uh, mixing it up podcast. We're trying a little uh, different style today. I'd rather be in the room with a person because, you know, get the vibes and everything. But under the certain circumstances that we have, uh, we want to keep the podcast going. So today, my guest is Mike Shurtenlieb. And uh, what's up, man? Oh, you know, it's another day in self-quarantine. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that, some of the things we're going to go over today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that. I know it's probably killing you, uh, the life of a musician that is always gigging and, and playing all the time. So I, 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 I can, I'm sure I can feel your pain with that. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, our backstory because we kind of actually go back quite a ways, you know. Um, just being around the scene and 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 in different circles, and uh, we're gonna just talk about man your love for drums and how you inspire me with your work ethic and how of all the musicians I've ever met, uh, just to see one that's as passionate as you and uh, takes your instrument serious in the way it should be is is uh, very inspiring to me, man. So you know, so thanks for coming on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure, man. Glad to be here. Oh yeah. Um, also, we'll talk a little bit about the new record that just dropped. I cool. just gave it a spin the other night, so um, I got a couple thoughts on that. Definitely an awesome record, so we'll talk about that too. Um, so just uh, to start off, um, shit, man, Poopak, right? Yeah. yeah no. <laughs> I was trying to think of that name forever. Like I was like, is it Tupac? I'm like, that's not fucking right. What was that? But Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, the, uh, the earliest iteration of King Crab Apple. Yep. So my band, which was a death metal band, still is a death metal band, <laughs> played with uh, Poo Pack. Shit, I think we played a handful of shows, Cuties, and then we played Go Go's. The ones I remember <laughs> most are uh, are at Go Go's with Double Flawless. Okay, okay. yeah, Double Flawless. Yep, uh, and okay, I remember that clearly. So uh, we go back a ways. Shit, what? How long? That's had to have been ten plus years, man. Right. Eight? I, I mean, I think that's <laughs> like, like if the timeline is right in my mind, that's probably 2008 or nine. Yep. So we go back quite a ways knowing each other and admiring each other's work. So, um, man, just when we get started, uh, for my viewers that don't know who you are, uh, give me a little backstory on yourself, man. And you know how you kind of got into the music and the drums and where it all started with you. Yeah, I guess, um, the, not, terribly extended version is um that my dad was a drummer and not that he was really actively playing in bands or anything when i was young but a few times when i was little there would be a drum kit in the house or he would have some friends over to jam like play old blues covers or whatever and when it came time i mean i knew that i loved music there was always music in my house growing up um and i knew that i loved it i just enjoyed music so when it came time to do school band, uh, I knew I wanted to be involved, and I knew pretty clearly that I wanted to be a drummer. Um, so that's really where it starts is like sixth grade band, Bunker Middle School. Okay. Uh, you know, playing yeah. a practice pad and symphonic band. And then uh, it, I really didn't start playing drum set until I was like 15 or 16. I was like well into the marching band and symphonic band kind of thing. Um, and yeah, just as my own interest in rock music and funk music and hip hop and all that stuff kind of developed as it does when you know, you're 13, 14 years old. Um, I first kind of got a taste of playing drum set. And then um, it's near the end of high school that I started that I got my own kit and started playing a whole lot, mostly just improvising in the basement at my parents' house with a few friends. Went to college, had a band, and then um, basically immediately started playing with William and Cutie and Wing right when I got out of college. And that was kind of my first um, like West Michigan music scene. Like I wasn't in any, any bands in high school or anything like that. Right, right. Um, yeah, and then I just I just really fell in love with writing music with my friends 
and gigging. Um, and then, you know, fast forward a few years of doing that. Um, and they're not exactly related, but kind of. Uh, my dad passed away in 2012. So it's sort of related that around that time, I like re fell in love with the instrument. Like not just playing in bands or gigging with my friends, but like that there's this whole universe to study and that I can spend the rest of my life like working at this craft, right, you know what I mean? Yeah. That there's all this stuff to explore. And that's kind of the jump off to starting more bands and studying and taking lessons and giving lessons and going to conventions and hoarding gear and all the stuff that I'm kind of doing now. Uh, all sort of stems from like this realization that if I want to be good at this, I need to work at it all the time. And then I can, there's no cap that I right. can just do it forever. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. So yeah, nowadays, well, when we're able to, right. I got <laughs> six or seven bands and write music and playing covers and just doing as much as I possibly can as a musician, you know? Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the one thing I always see about you staying consistent, you know? So even if one band has downtime, you're, you're willing to gig or, do whatever it takes to be better. And it, you know, the way I look at that, uh, you know, from the outside and correct me if I'm wrong is I, you know, I'm the same way. I want to jam with everybody and, you know, take as much time up as I can. But I also feel like maybe for you, that gives you diversity and that can make you better at your instrument. Right. I mean, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, not only like playing different styles, you know, where, say doing Biffy is this very production oriented play along with the tracks, Short hairs like a punk band, Flex is this big, lots of moving parts, you gotta stay out of the way, all that stuff. Um, but I also just, I, I truly believe that every person that makes music, kind of regardless of skill level, has a voice, right? Right. And, and the more you can kind of mingle with those voices, the way somebody plays guitar, uh, that isn't the person you play with all the time is going to make you play different things or your ideas are going to come out in different ways. Yeah. So I'm just, I'm just always trying to, yeah, like diversify who I'm playing with um, for that as well. Cause I think it's fascinating. Yeah. And I think uh, just seeing, you know, I've seen several of your different bands and uh, you blend really well. And, and like you said, you know, when to stay out of the way, you know, when to just stay in the pocket and you know, when to do your own thing and to contribute. So I think that's one of the main qualities about drummers. And I mean, there's not a lot of them around, but, <laughs> or at least ones that are committed to their instrument, you know, there's people that play, but you know, um, so would you say, though, you know, flex is like your main thing, though? Does that thing take precedent over all the other ones? Is that like you're kind of, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, for the last few years, um, it's absolutely that way. And that's, it's kind of hard to put my finger on exactly why. Um, some of it is related to like, quote, success, where right. Right. that's the band that is the kind of easiest to book or gets the biggest draw. Mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of makes sense to, to focus on that and kind of push that down the road as far as I can. Um, and also it's like, it's in a lot of ways, it's like the freshest one. Um, yeah, I, I'm not really entirely sure why. It's not totally intentional that that's the quote main focus, but right. it certainly is. Right. right. Well, um, you know, I, I think it does have part of that where the, you guys have a draw, you know, you're easier to book because I seen you out in uh, North Muskegon when you guys were playing uh, right by the water there. I brought, yeah, I brought the kid out there and everything. And, you know, that's just one of those gigs where there's bands that are not going to be able to play that type of deal. Right. Yeah. You know, and because we kind of do this funk rock soul thing and we and because we play a lot of covers we can kind of cater to, okay, we're going to do 45 minutes at this festival at midnight right? and make it originals and bangers and jam and rock and all that. Or you can play in the afternoon at a park for a bunch of families and chop out all the swear words and play Maroon 5 covers. And you know what I mean? Like we can kind of bend it to be accessible for the, 
whatever crowd we're playing to. Right. So um, let me ask you something real quick, because I do want to talk about the record that just dropped. Uh, we're going to get into that for sure. But uh, let me just ask you, man, because I know how hard it is to keep a band together. How is it with like six? Well, you got six guys in the band. Is that how many guys? Uh, if Seven? You count, if you count Spat, the non-musical member, there are eight of us. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, um, how hard is that to navigate? I mean, Jesus, I'm in a band with two other guys, and we can't even get a practice together. So I couldn't even imagine what, you know, seven guys, seven active guys are. Uh, well, I mean, it's a challenge for sure. Uh, and some parts of it are more challenging than others. Um, we've gotten pretty good about, uh, like, we're pretty consistent in terms of, like, Wednesday evening is rehearsal. And unless something changes, everyone can just assume that at 6.30 p.m. we're all supposed to be in my apartment. And uh, one of the upsides of having a band with so many people is that sometimes if somebody can't make it, we can still get shit done. Um, and yeah, I mean, it goes back and forth. Like sometimes it's, it's a hassle or it's really stressful to align everybody's schedules or those kinds of things but for the most part people are committed to the bands and yeah. and want to show up and right. we have so much fun playing and writing together that um you know even when it's hectic people still make time for it and uh and also we've done pretty well about like uh so uh, me and Spat both work for longer days. It's like virtual assistants. And Rob used to work there and is a web developer now. So like we all, at least a bunch of us, kind of have our hands in the technology. So we use Slack to chat and we've got shared calendars and we've got Facebook group and we have all these kind of systems in place that we can set reminders and schedules and you know what I mean? Like right. make as many systems as we can to keep everybody on the same page. Yeah, yeah. That, that I can see where that can help. And also just like you said, the commitment, you know, you, mm -hmm. you got to be committed to it. You know, it can't be like everything takes precedent over it. You got to just be like, no, my Wednesday nights are booked. We have exactly. goals we want to accomplish. And then when you get there, you have fun anyway. So it's kind of like, you know, yep. what, what else are you trying to do? You know, yep, so, that's exactly it. And nice. Of course, like any band, some rehearsals are super productive and some uh whatever you yeah you know, nobody has very many creative ideas or you, you just whatever right you run through some tunes and people are tired and you call it right, right. Yeah, yeah yeah exactly especially that week middle of the week jam yeah, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um so l let's talk a little bit about the record man so i gave it a spin um you know i liked it uh yeah i i, I love the record you know uh obviously the vocals are always stand out you know, um, to me, I did notice how what you said earlier kind of um, resonated with me as well as like kind of when you said, you know, when to stay out of the way. I noticed there wasn't a lot of mic parts necessarily on there, No, but it's more or less just keeping the funk there and keeping the groove together. But um, what is it? Alive and Dying? Yeah. That yeah, song was that, too, that song was awesome. And then the one um, I wrote it down but I don't have it right here, obviously. But I think it's the one that's after that, something about the boy or yeah, Lost, uh, Lost, Boy. Lost Boy. Yeah, yeah those no. two those two were, man, they just kind of, I don't know, they touched me in my soul, man. And I was like, that's that's when music really happens. You know, I, I mean, I can get behind you guys' this funk thing and, and that, and that's not really necessarily what I listen to all the time. But I, uh, you know, some of the horn parts remind me, Jason Mraz is one of my favorite artists. So like okay. there's some horn parts where it reminds me of, like a la Jason Mraz, like some of the stuff he does live and some of the older stuff. Sure. Um, but yeah, you guys mix a really good amount of elements between kind of like funk and soul, but you know, um, yeah, I really dug the record, man. It, it was awesome. So tell me a little bit about how, how that came about and, Unfortunately, you couldn't do the release, and maybe we'll talk a little yeah. bit about that. But, you know, how is that process, you know, writing a record and then recording? Well, so um, we probably take a very different approach than you historically take, right? Like, I know that uh, just because, we've, again, we've been friends for a long time. I know that 
uh, say, Infinite's approach is kind of like you set out to write a record and then you kind of compose until you finish the record, record the thing and put it out. Right, yeah, yeah. So we don't really write that way. Uh, it doesn't really ever have anything to do with a, an album goal. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we write everything very collectively. Um, and that might be Rob's got a riff, William's got a progression, Carp's got a bass line, I've got a groove, whatever. And we just kind of improvise around and work it out together until eventually the composition is finished, right? Yeah, that makes sense. And then when we have enough songs, we go record them and put out a record. Okay, yeah. Uh, And there could be, you know, I would say right now, there are probably five tunes that are in some middle section of completion. You know, there's like a couple right. of parts or maybe a horn part. They don't have lyrics yet or we're not quite sure about the arrangement. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So as far as that specific record, it's really just that's the amount of songs that we have complete that we didn't already record. Right. Um, and just, you know, like put them in a collection and put them out. Uh, as far as the actual process goes, we don't do like any in the studio writing. Um, unless of course, uh, as I'm sure you've also experienced, uh, you go to track something and you go, Oh, I didn't know we were doing that. Right. Oh yeah. Or you like encounter <laughs> some, you know, some weird murkiness or yeah. whatever, or yeah. you put the song to a click for the first time yep. and go, Oh, whoa, we do that bridge. Like, 10 clicks faster than the rest of the song. Yeah. And kind of making those adjustments in the studio. But generally speaking, the songs are finished. We've often already been performing them. And then we just go in and capture what we've been playing live. Um, yeah, so it's not a, not very much like, like demoing or adjusting in the studio or rewriting parts or anything like that. Just more of a free flowing, and then once you kind of got it, you're like, "Yeah, that's ready," and then and then let's let's rip exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. that. I mean, that's pretty dope because that's the most organic way to go about it. And I mean, I I think that lends heavy to you guys' style and your music anyway, because everything you guys do is really organic, and the record showed that to me. You know, so and that's and that's a big part of um, not only why I love being in this band so much, but a way that our sort of sound has developed is um, when we kind of, we set out to be a quote funk band Mm -hmm. and that sort of aligns with the instrumentation and the way I play drums and the way Cart plays bass and the way Marty plays sax. And, but at the same time, like we also like a bunch of heavy music or a bunch of hip hop music or like Carp is super into the band like kind of old classic Rocky. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so we, we take this approach of like all ideas are valid. So we're not, it's never like, like setting out to fit into one thing. So instead it's just like, Oh, well, that's a cool guitar idea. Let's follow that thread and see where it goes. Right. And it might end up being some like soul ballad and great right or there'll be some synthesizer part and we're like oh that's really cool let's follow that thread and then it ends up being this funky thing or a heavy thing or whatever right um yeah so we're just kind of exploring the ideas all the time and even at a rehearsal like in a writing session um basically anyone's suggestions will give it a try a few times maybe make sure we can do something clean. Oh, let's try that. Let's put a bar of six at the end of that chorus. And then you do it a few times and you go, ah, never mind. That wasn't such a great idea. Yeah. Moving on. Right. Yeah. So it's a lot of exploration and just kind of figuring out what feels the best. And then it kind of gets everyone's stamp of approval and we move on from there. Yeah. Um, like I said, uh, 
I can tell on the record, very organic. Each song, even though you guys have your own identity and sound, each song to me, I could tell from like a producer standpoint and a musician standpoint, where it's like every song kind of takes its own path too. So you can tell that maybe that's when, you know, a uh, dude started with guitar riff or, or, you know, carp started with some bass line that you guys could funk over, you know, and then I noticed there was a few sections in there. I can't name them exactly, but where the synth was the element that you guys kind of wrote on for a for little, little bit, bit, you know? Yeah, so. exactly. And with, and with so many people, um, and this is actually kind of a, an ongoing, uh, like work in progress for us is, is making sure that we're leaving the appropriate sonic space. Um, cause there are a lot of us in the band and really, if you think about it, it's, I mean, four, at least four of the instruments are quote melody instruments or like lead instruments. So we have to be really aware of where the horn parts sit with the vocals or, you know, is it a busy guitar part? Well, then maybe it's a simple keyboard part. And if it's a busy keyboard part, then maybe it's a simple guitar part. And that's like, and, it's, and same goes for me too, as far as like, if I'm crashing too much or where to put fills or even like ghost notes and stuff. Like sometimes it's just strip all that stuff away. So the keyboard part pops out or right. the, you know, horn line pops out or whatever. And I, I think, I think that's we're kind a... of, we're kind of constantly refining that and getting better at listening to each other and leaving space and all that kind of stuff. I think that's one of the most important decisions you can make as a collective is knowing that the silence sometimes is, you know, the Absolutely. simplicity is, is the best, you know, and that's, that's one thing when you play metal for a long time and you try to be technical and everything, sometimes, you know, when, when you try to look at it from a songwriting uh, perspective, which we've kind of done, you know, the last album we just recorded is more or less, uh, you know, when, know when to, uh, you know, you don't need to flash out and, and do all this crazy shit all the time just because you can, you know, it, it doesn't right. mean, you know. And like a, a good strummed whole note is just as effective in the right scenario as like crazy sweet picking or whatever. I think as musicians, we get caught up in this. I've practiced my instrument for so long. I got to play for other musicians. And once you can start realizing that that's not important anymore, because like 90%, especially probably in your case, I don't want to say 90%, that might be heavy, but we'll just say 70, 30, 30% sure. of musicians are going to listen to your band. Right. But 70% really is going to be for the person that's just a fan of music or you know, in your in your case, uh, someone that likes to dance, you know, because you, know, exactly. you get a lot of you know people that come out and just want to dance, people of all ages. So that makes a huge difference. And when you know when to space that music out like that, so mm -hmm. that's that's awesome. And I and I struggle with that a lot, man. That's kind of a constant in my head about like again, like kind of technical playing versus quote pocket playing mm -hmm. or or just kind of learning to love a well-executed, ultra-simple groove and, and feeling what that does and right. not really worrying about the sticking pattern or how many notes it is. Like, right. you know, how does it feel? Yeah. Like, what's, the, what's the momentum it's creating? You know, and I really come to uh, admire uh, some professional drummers that are really, really, really great at that. Um, and that a lot of people don't know about because they're not a, some super flashy player. Uh, there's a guy, the first, like the kind of prime example is a, a dude named Jim Keltner that has been one of the kind of go-to studio guys for 40 or 50 years. But we've all been listening to this dude play our entire lives. But you never even think about it because there aren't flashy fills. But it's like, oh, if you pick a, you know, Paul Simon record, it might be Kelton. If you pick a James Taylor record, it might be Kelton. Right. You know, all of these great songwriters are all this stuff that's super catchy and super memorable that has all of this wonderful kind of pulse and texture underneath it that never makes you go, oh, the drummer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that's part of the job. You yeah. know what I mean? Right. And, you know, that that particular backbeat, that funk led to that song and how popular that was or that artist for that, you know, and, and people don't exactly. really realize, like, going back to the thing I just said, you know, the 70-30 thing where it's like 
no one knows because it's not necessary because yeah. the average listener is just like, okay, that's a good beat. If they right. can well, even you, keep it. How does it make you feel? <laughs> right. <laughs> you exactly. know, that's really the question is how does it make you feel? So a uh, little bit about the recording process. I know we kind of talked about that, um, shifting gears just a slight bit. Um, sure. You guys basically did that yourself, right? I mean. Yep. Yeah, William that plays keys yeah. and uh, plays guitar and can crab apple, and he and I have been in bands together. I mean, he's like my longest kind of musical collaborator. Um, yeah, he's got a home studio and has – you know, just like all of us and anything else, been honing his skills and his microphone collection and all that stuff. So, yeah, we did um, both Ken Crab Apple records and now both Flex records are all just done. Well, I guess the first Ken Crab Apple record was tracked one one place and then William mixed it. Okay. But yeah, the second KC record and both Flex records have all just been done in William's home studio. Nice. Kudos to that. I thought it sounded really crisp, really good. Um, I want to listen to it in a little something else it has because I listen to it in headphones, but I want to ha- listen to it in something with a little more low end and get a little more sure. oomph. But, uh, yeah, I thought everything had its place, and it was uh, done really well. You So you do use a click track? Yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah, because of, uh, um, well, partly space limitations and then just because it's so many parts. Uh, we definitely do the like individual tracking. Yeah, for sure. Like, you know, like I play to a click in a room by myself, uh, usually with scratch bass or maybe scratch bass and guitar mm-hmm. and headphones. Yeah. And a click. Yeah. And then we just kind of layer from there. Yeah, that's that's really the only way to go anymore, man. You got to, you know, recordings forever, too. I guess, you know, there there's some people that, that kind of goes back and forth with that, but if you're recording, you know, and you want it to be right, you gotta, you gotta play with a click. Yeah. I have kind of mixed feelings about that. Like I would actually really like to, because so when we did the short hair album, uh, we did that with Addison. Yeah. And we just did that. I mean, the only thing overdubbed is uh, a little bit of guitar and the vocals. So we just did that. The three of us in a room, no click, like just play the tunes. Um, and there's something to be said for that too, or like, and I would, I'm interested in exploring that for flex maybe. Um, I'm not really sure. It's, it's tough because if you record as a group, then like if one person hits a sour note, the whole take for everybody is ruined. Right. Exactly. Um, you, and it goes to save time though, too. You know, that's a thing. It's yeah. like being able to track it part by part, you know, that's a luxury we have now. You know, mm-hmm. for you, I wouldn't, if I was in your band, I would say, let's fucking jam it, bro. And, and let's just see what happens. But like, right. you know, there's other types of drumming and other things that it's like, it's just easier to go part by part to make sure it's right for the record, you know? So, yeah. I mean, I, I understand both sides of the fence, but as a producer, I'm like, the other problem is, is I'll tell you what, Mike, the problem I've encountered when people, they don't know how to play to a click. Now that's completely fucking different. Right. Oh, <laughs> Where they're yeah. intimidated by the click. And then I'm like, Oh, you don't play with a click because you can't. That's why. Mm-hmm. <laughs> then that just shows a whole bunch of foundation issues. And it goes all the way back from, you know, well, you know it's, a, it's a whole skill of its own, man. Um, especially in my case where I'm, I'm writing the parts organically in a room with my bandmates and without a click. And, um, and then you go into studio and you go to play these parts that you've been playing for a month or two. And suddenly you put a click on and you'll like, you'll discover some weird inconsistencies about your own playing or about the way you've been performing the song, whatever it might be. And, and that always, that raises this kind of important question. We actually dealt with that a couple of times making, this most recent flex record where it's like, well, which is the right choice for the tune? Like if say, like I'll, I'll use a concrete example. There's the, the bridge in Alive and Die. Um, when we first went to record it, it was like uh, alarming how much we were rushing that bridge and not even like speeding up through it, but I mean like, the moment we hit the downbeat was like a tempo change. And we had to kind of decide, well, do we want the whole song to be one tempo? And then that bridge will feel a little bit different. 
which is ultimately what we decided. And I like it better that way. And now when we perform it in my mind, I know to kind of pull back. Right. But the other option is also there where it's like, well, we wrote the song this way just because the grid doesn't agree with it. That doesn't make the ideas invalid. Right. right? Yep. You know, it's still kind of in time with itself. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's just kind of an interesting, it's kind of an interesting minefield to navigate of deciding kind of what it is you want the final product to sound like, or if you kind of want to put the metronome in the driver's seat, or if you want to put the composition in the driver's seat. Yeah. We, we write that same way too, is we'll sit there and we'll write something, we'll work on it forever. And then we'll say, okay, what BPM is that? And then we'll start playing with a click. Then it's like, like you said, okay, that riff is now not the same at all. (laughs) Especially, You know, I don't know how you guys do it, and I guess I'd be interested in to know, but, you know, uh, the early Infinite Design releases were, like, the songs had multiple tempo changes throughout the whole thing, so that made it even harder, but some of the one that we just laid down, we tried to keep everything more to a close, at least, to one tempo, just to make everything a lot more simplistic and, and right. to know, you know, be able to carry that energy, because it has a different energy when you're switching tempos all the time, too, you know, but... Well, and I think that I think that is uh, not even just in the difference with say between say our two bands, but the difference in genre, like especially in the earlier Infinite stuff, where it's like this is technical death metal, right? right? Yeah. Like you, this part to this part to this part to this part, and tempo changes and feel changes are kind of expected. Where from the kind of like funk perspective, that's like the opposite of what you want, right? It's like yeah. a dance group. Yep. Um, but we still, you know, we find some places where, yeah, maybe it is best to just get to the end of the song and turn the click off and the outro will just be what it is. Yeah. Um, the last song on that flex album has a weird, like feel shift. Like the 16th note becomes the like six, eight, eighth note. And we tried doing that to a click a handful of times but it just wasn't quite right. So we just like, like played up until that shift and then just cut the click out. So then the end of the song kind of like loosely unfolds as it's supposed to, you know? And, and that's nice too, you know, keeping it organic, you know, so. Mm-hmm. Um, no, man, I love Black Sabbath. I love Led Zeppelin. It ain't a click track of, within a thousand miles of those songs. oh right yeah exactly you know a lot of that older music you know just the different um you know even the pink floyd uh dark side of the moon record when they engineered that they had to actually move those faders as they're recording so the engineer's uh performance was just as important as the person playing the instrument you know exactly so man. you know or organic uh is the way but i guess we've like you said, there, there's always two sides of the story, right? When it right. comes to that. So, um, I just kind of look at it as like, like whatever the process is, great. You know what I mean? Like, it, and that kind of circles back to even like playing in multiple bands or whatever. Whereas just whichever way you want to try. Or I feel like we should all do a super gridded out, close mic you know to the click perfect record right we should also all do uh, two room mics and no click and everybody just plays at the same time and you know what leave the mistakes in who cares yeah, yeah. You know, and just like and those are now neither one is better or worse right yep exactly and all the things in between that too like it's art right We're yeah to experiment yeah exactly um Let's talk about your uh, beat of the day thing real quick, man. So, sure. you know, uh, you've been keeping that going for I don't know how many, but, uh, you know, just another thing with you being consistent. And where'd that come about? And, you know, we kind of I, I had mentioned about it and you're like, yeah, I just kind of do it for myself. Just something that you, you know, do every day and put together. Not anything that if people see it, they see it. Cool. If not, if not, you know, but I mean, it is you playing drums. So tell me a little bit about that, man. You know, I always watch them. So. So it started two years ago, maybe. Um, yeah, I think I'd have to like look on Instagram, but I think the first 
lunch break groove is like May 27th, 2018, I think. Um, so my office, my day job is uh, the third floor above Unruly. So right downtown. And my house is the Temple House, like just on the edge of downtown. So my office is like a mile away from my house. So I come home for lunch, like every day. So our rehearsal space is my living room. So like I walk in the door and there's a drum set, right? So I started just playing on my lunch breaks. Like, oh, I got 10 or 15 minutes. I'll just play drums a little bit. So then I just kind of started making Instagram videos out of it. And then once I had done maybe five or six of them, I'm like, oh, maybe I should number these. Like, I guess I'll keep track. And then, uh, as is the case with so many things, like you give it a name, yeah. and then <laughs> you're kind of obligated to do it. Right, yeah. So that was just really, just kind of very naturally. Um, and, you know, during normal times when we're leaving our houses, um, I, don't, I don't do them every day. Uh, it's, it just kind of dependent on what my lunch break looks like. You know, if I'm slammed in the office and I don't take a lunch break or just grab something from across the street and go back to work, I don't make one. Or if I have other stuff to do, I don't make one. But I would say, you know, three or four a week is, was pretty standard. Yeah. And then, um, I guess early March when all of this stay at home stuff started, I was on, Oh, I don't know, number 259 or something like that. And then, uh, well, if I'm not going to the office, I'm not actually taking a lunch break. So then instead, I just changed the hashtag from uh, lunch break groups to drumvid19. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, yeah, I have made one every day for like, I think, 34 days now. Oh, shit. Yeah. And again, it's it's... It's really low pressure. I I don't have microphones. I'm not. I'm. I seriously put my iPhone in a capo to make it stand up and set it on a shelf and play for a couple of minutes. Use my phone to chop it into a minute and put it on Instagram. And that's all. Nice. You know, there's no mixing. There's no overlays. There's no nothing like that. Right. Um. Because the the point the point of putting them out into the world and not just because the, the main, the main thing is for me to come track progress, right. Or capture ideas or whatever. But the point of putting them out into the world, especially kind of pre pandemic and lockdown and stuff yeah, is like, man, if I can spend 10 minutes of my lunch break composing something and playing it, so can you. Yeah. And right. any, any human that has this creative thing that they're into, like, if you just carve out a couple of minutes a day, you know, it doesn't have to be 10 hours. It doesn't have to be your full-time job. Like, and, and I mean, that's my approach is, um, especially for the quote lunch break groups. I've been a little looser lately, but it really is an attempt to be compositional. It's like come up with a one or two bar loop, get it under my hands well enough to play it, record it, post it, go back to work. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not supposed to be a solo. It's right. like supposed to be chops. Yeah. It's just like some brief drum set composition, you know? Yeah. Yeah. They're still cool and interesting though. I mean, I, like I said, I like to see some of the different grooves you come up with and the different drum setups. Cause I like how you put sometimes put a cymbal on the snare or, you know, just, just. I'm constantly changing the setup around. Yeah, just be creative with it, you know. And I think that's the important thing when you're practicing anything. You know, a lot of people think, you know, even 15 minutes a day does a lot more than just practicing one hour on Sunday or something oh, like that. Absolutely, you know? man. So it's just trying to get that 15 minutes a day and, and get some ideas and be creative, you know. Um, and, that's, I, and it has turned into this wonderful, like I said, like now I sort of feel obligated to do it. Um there have been a couple over these last 30 days or so. There's one of them. I'm like, look haggard. I mean, my pajamas and a <laughs> shirt. And I was like, I was like hung over and unmotivated and in a shitty mood. Didn't even want to play drums. Didn't even want the loud noises, but it's like, well, I'm 20 days into this. I can drag my ass out of bed and play drums for five minutes. Right. 
Yeah. And I did. And like that, I like that part of it too. You know what I mean? Where it's like, because I've been putting them out into the world, I have some kind of self-imposed obligation to continue doing it. You know what I mean? Yeah, that makes sense. I, and I totally can relate to that. So you started it, you want to see it through type thing, you know? Exactly. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit. So how are you handling the quarantine, man? I know it sucks for you because of all the band practices canceled and, you know, our album, our album's been put on hold, but I do a lot of shit by myself as a producer. So like, right. I'm, I'm, I'm getting shit done and feeling creative, but for you as somebody that's always gigging or practicing or whatever, so how are you holding up and, and how has your routine changed? I mean, you know, man, it's in some ways it's really tough. Uh, I miss my bandmates. I miss making music with other people. I miss being on stage. Uh, we've had can't, we've had tour canceled. We canceled the CD release party. We've got festivals that are canceling and all that hurts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I only see my lady like once a week now and that hurts too. Yeah. Uh, but the upside or the, the good part about all of it is I have drums and I, you know, I like some of the things that I like to do much in, like your case, like are done by myself, um, whether that's practicing or uh, I've gotten back into doing some fiction writing, which is honestly my creative background well before being a musician. I've been kind of a word nerd writer. That's what I do for a living and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, well, the isolation is weird. My sleep schedule is destroyed. Um, but I have been really making a point to play drums every day, to be writing, to read, and just do creative stuff. Um, and that's really, really, really helpful. Like, more than I can describe. I would be lost if it weren't for the drum set sitting right over there. Right, yeah. Yeah, it's it's different for people that have that have hobbies and 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 not just hobbies, but you know, passionate or things they're passionate about. You know, so I'm I haven't really missed too much of a step, and uh, you know, because I don't play as many live shows as I would like to, or you know, should. But um, you know, some people, you know, I, I think they miss their whole gratitude portion of this thing too. It's like, man, be grateful that you know we're it sucks for the economy and stuff like that, but there's not much we can do. And, you know, I guess I'd right. rather be alive and be healthy. And I'd rather, you know, have my friends alive and healthy than, Hey, we might not be able to play shows this year or go to shows this year, but we have to, you know, you got to make the best of it. You still got your yep. life and you still got your drums. You still got your skills. You can just That's come exactly out, right, man. You know, you can just come out of it better. Right. right. You know, so. I will say too, uh, even though it's not, it's like for a bad reason. Um, but I also, I'm like way less stressed out. Um, if nothing else, because my schedule is flat, you know, there isn't this, okay, so we got to travel two hours on Friday. So I got to make sure I get this thing done at work and tell this person and oh, right. But snack pack had to do this meeting. So we're going to load without him and, you know, like all the logistical stuff that goes into rehearsals and gigs and travel. Um, I don't have to do any of it. Right. Uh, so that's kind of this weird, what all, this whole chunk of time that was often spent uh, kind of being a communicator and making sure all the calendar details are right and all of that kind of stuff, I just don't have to do. Right. Um, so that's interesting. Uh, I'm going back, like, I have certainly been spending my fair amount of time watching movies and playing video games, right. um, which I sort of feel guilty about, but also sort of don't. Um, I'm getting better all the time at, like, it's cool, man, just let yourself relax. Yeah. Or, or at least especially when it comes to movies and video games, um, they are works of art, and I do enjoy them. And if I expect other people to casually spend their time consuming the art that I make, then I can feel good about consuming the art that other people make. 
Wow, man, that's uh, I've never looked at it that way, but that's a very interesting way to look at it, you know. Mm -hmm. And I agree, hundred percent for sure. And like, dude, I I love movies. I think they're so cool. I love that it's visual and literary and musical. And honestly, man, like the the video games that I choose to play are like the I love the like gigantic open world single player full of detail uh like I could care less about running around doing like deathmatch Fortnite gaming right yeah 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 but I love to play Skyrim okay yeah. and and just kind of admire the designs of the buildings and I think about that a human being wrote all of these lines of dialogue. And all, so I really am trying to take, when I check out and I'm like, well, I don't want to write anything. It's too late to play drums. I'm tired, blah, blah, blah. I really, I try to flip that switch in my brain and be like, really devour the stuff that these pe the other people are making. You know what I mean? I'm yeah. like, let myself sink into it. It's not just distraction. It's not just a waste of time. Yeah, you know, it, it is a work of art that hundreds or thousands of people spend a huge amount of effort making. Yeah, you know? for sure. One thing I've noticed about video games too, and uh, I I play you know maybe once once a week sometimes to try to stay up late because my schedule is weird and I have to stay up sometimes. So sometimes sitting in front of the computer working on music is is tough for me because then I start it all just start zoning out and i'll be listening to the same loop like 40 times half fall yeah. asleep but if i get in front of the video games at least i'm kind of like doing something but i have noticed and uh it's like you can get addicted to that like accomplishing something because i was like what playing the spider-man game and like, like even yeah. though you know it's like I, okay i'm accomplishing something every day with my beats or learning something new on the keyboard or on my guitar or whatever it may be but then it's like you sit there and play that and you make this little you know accomplishment and then you kind of like oh i just need to make another one so at least you you know sometimes you can't feel accomplished doing that you know i in the it, like it is very it's very dangerous it's 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 you know. very you know, I, I looked at, I was playing this game called Shadow of War, and I, I actually talked about this on uh, James' podcast, and I looked back at it, and it said something about, um, I had put it down for a long time and then picked it back up, but it said something about how I spent like 60 hours playing it, and I was like, "Yeah, fuck, you know what I could have did with that 60 hours? <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I feel Damn, that. man. But it, I, it, I it's like anything else man it's the it's the kind of balancing act and uh figuring out how to not let those sort of arbitrary or hollow video game rewards replace real life reward or or doing things like setting a alarm for when you're going to stop playing that game yeah or the like but i complete this quest i'm done yeah for today um, or just the, some of those little kinds of things that just strive for more balance so you don't get totally because I mean they're, they're built to be immersive yeah yep. um, just like scroll through social media forever like their whole goal is to keep you there yeah so yeah we could go we, to lose a lot of time but we could go through a whole nother podcast about that but um. <laughs> yeah <very good. laughs> Um, so let's switch gears a little bit here, man. So let's just say this is a pre, uh, and we you kind of alluded to that a little bit, say this is pre-COVID-19. Um, give me some advice on how you find balance to do do it all, man. Like, you know, like, is it scheduling? Is it systems? You know, you had touched on that, or is it just the desire to keep pushing and keep going? Is it passion, or is it a little bit of everything? Or what, what would you say, you know? I mean, I, I think it's all of the above. Um, and I want to be clear that like, I, again, kind of pre pandemic, I do a lot of things, but I don't know how it looks from the outside. Like even in normal day life, man, like I still just like have a beer and bullshit with my friends after work. I still watch movies. I still go to lunch with my girlfriend, you know, it's not like I'm in this perpetual 
productive hustle grind all the time thing right but i also realized that i do probably do a lot more of that than say the average person right mm -hmm. and it comes down to like like if the passion is a big part of it. um when it when it comes to music making like i am unable currently to make my living as a drummer so what that means like i have to eat so i have a job and if my job is nine to five then drums are five to nine like and i really do treat it in a lot of ways like another job it's something that i want to do but also something that i have to do like if i want if i want to play shows if i want to travel farther if i want people to listen to the music that i make that requires a certain degree of effort right and I've sort of resigned myself to just putting in that effort as best I can, as often as I can. Um, and sometimes that means taking days off. Sometimes that means a totally lazy day and not doing a single productive thing at all. Um, but it's a lot about like, just kind of constantly chipping away or constant improvement. Um, even if it's very, very incremental. So, so that means like, like even that, that even kind of ties into like developing systems where if you take the time to set up all your shared calendars and kind of make a template for what information goes in every calendar event, well, then you've kind of spent some effort to then simplify a process that you can just repeat every time. Right. Um, so that's part of it. Uh, I don't know, man. Like another part of it is like somewhere in the back of my mind, um, nothing I do is ever good enough for me. Yeah. And I'm sure you share that. I think we, that's a major thing that we have in common. Oh yeah, for sure. Um, and that translates into like, like doing shit anyway. Uh, I don't feel like practicing. I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. Um, I don't feel like making this phone call. Man, I'll do it anyway. And just some of that kind of stuff where it's like, and I also, I mean, I take in a lot of information or kind of motivational stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, like, there's all this great stuff from Tim Ferriss about okay. the muse, like the muse shows up when you do. Yeah. Like, yep. You won't get any writing done unless you sit down to write. Yep. Uh, you won't get, you won't make any progress on your instrument if you don't pick it up. So, and you can do all these things like telling yourself, I'm going to practice for 10 minutes, but really you sit down and you get into it. You'll do it for an hour. Yeah. Um, so like, that's part of it to me, you know, it's just like making myself show up and then kind of doing as much as I can, even if I don't feel terribly motivated to do so. Um, another big trick for me is like accessibility. Like again, when I open the door to my apartment, the first thing I see is a drum set. I'm sitting here at my desk and right in front of me, <laughs> like literally yeah. a, a pad on a stand with a book and a pair of sticks under my desk so if i'm watching a youtube video i can go and play practice step. yeah and it's like about i don't have to go into the other room i don't have to take the book off the shelf it's just sitting there ready to be done yeah um so that's kind of part of it too is tricking myself into if you see it you'll do it yeah yeah. But if it's, you know, if it, my kit was in a rehearsal studio on the other side of town, well, I probably wouldn't play as much because then it's this whole ordeal of going to do the thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to describe it. It's probably just that I'm a busybody and kind of a crazy person. Um, and, and you take action. You're an action oriented person, you know? Action. I try to be, man. Yeah. I, there's a lot of kind of dissonance in my moods or mindset where 
you know, some days I feel frantic and it's like, I got to do a million things and I'll never make enough progress. And then and there's other days where I just feel disconnected and checked out. And it's kind of riding those waves. And when I'm feeling down, trying to put in some effort anyway, and then when I'm feeling uh, kind of hyperactive or super motivated, like really trying to capture that and, and using that time to like, okay, I'm gonna, I feel obsessed with drums today. So I'm gonna practice for four hours. Yeah. But in a week, I might be like, no, I don't know. But if I can do 20 minutes a day, awesome. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and that goes the same for booking stuff, for promoting stuff, whatever. Like I'll, I'll kind of go in these waves of like, oh man, got a lot of gaps in the calendar. And I'll spend a couple of days like hitting booking super hard. And then that's kind of enough to like ride that wave. Yeah, that, that so, makes sense. You know, it's all over the place, man. Yeah. And just being a human, I think we all go through that. You know, I'll never, I got a million things to do today. I'll never get it all done. And then some days you get it all done and then you're like, okay, I'm going to do more today because of that other day I didn't get shit done. So, you know. right. Right. Um, couple more things here man and uh you know i want to respect your time i know you probably got stuff to do or maybe you don't so i don't know <laughs> <laughs> i mean i, I always find stuff yeah to yeah for sure um but no I, i'm in no real rush at all when it when it comes to you know playing your instrument looking from the outside in you know how you know why don't you give some advice you know on somebody that wants to practice and get better at their instrument say they're just picking up drums or just picking up guitar because you can you sure. can approach it from you know it, all all aspects you know it doesn't matter the instrument but you know what is some advice you could give maybe to somebody that might be listening to this and they're you know just starting to do something no matter what it is you know but you know dedicating yeah. themselves um i have three things come to mind uh the first is the simplest but probably the most difficult and that is the idea of patience like i have been playing drums for 22 years. I have been studying actively as an adult drum set player for seven years. Um, and I feel like I have a million miles to go. Like I'll never get to all the things like the stuff I work on isn't showing up in my playing all of that stuff. And I have to kind of constantly remind myself and to do my best to remind others that like, it's a marathon. And that, and that working, chipping away at the thing, you're kind of laying bricks that you'll walk on five years from now. Okay. And that just, and that like, if you just kind of, it's cliche, but like trust the process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, and then if you just keep chipping away at it, eventually all of those things will start to come together. Okay. Um, and then sort of related to that, uh, I go back and forth subscribing to these online drum lessons called mikeslessons.com. And uh, it'll probably be reversed, but I'm wearing this bracelet that says embrace the suck. Okay. <laughs> I can see it. <laughs> and the idea is like skill acquisition is difficult. And the first time you do anything, you're probably going to be really bad at it. And learning, learning to embrace being bad at something as the first step of being good at something mm -hmm. um, or, or fighting through that, oh, this is frustrating. I'll never get it. I should stop. Yeah. yeah. Um, especially if you're like first starting an instrument, Oh, it seems impossible. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, it's the the beginning of the learning curve is so steep. But it ties back to patience, you know, just like if you just keep chipping away and allowing yourself to kind of sit in that discomfort and just struggle bus and make one inch of progress then all of that accumulates over time, you know? 
Um, and uh, on that same token, uh, if you've been playing an instrument for a long time, practice isn't supposed to sound good. If you sound good, you're not practicing. Right, yeah. Like, you're supposed to work on the stuff you can't do. Like, and that's what will give you improvement. Like, if you just play all the licks you already know how to play and, and run through all the scales you already know, yeah, like, there's some, something to be said for, like, maintenance. But you're not really learning anything. Like, it, right. should, it should be difficult. Um, or else you aren't really learning anything. Yeah. Uh, and then the, the last little bit it, it, it kind of conflicts with embracing the suck, but like, do the shit that you like. Like, I, like, I really enjoy the kind of music that you make. Uh, there are, like, let's say, like, infinite. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I really like Lamb of God. I really like Car Bomb. I like, but like, I don't play double bass at all. Right. Yeah. Not even, a, I've never owned one. I am terrible at it. But the music that I want to make doesn't require it. Yeah. I don't, so I don't spend any time on it. Yeah. Like, there's this list of things that are possible to do on a drum set or on any instrument. But if you feel obligated to tackle them all, then you won't really tackle any of them. Yeah, that's true. So, like, I at least try to, for the most part, practice things that I want to be part of my play. And not just something from a list that says, these are the things that you're supposed to be able to do. Yeah. Um, and there's some balance there. But, like, especially for a younger musician or people just getting started, uh, it's okay to kind of pick a lane or at least explore a lane. Yeah. To figure, like, if you want to be a black metal gravity blast drummer, well, then maybe you don't really need to work so hard on, like, jazz combat and, and, like, figuring out, like, the nice, like, lope of a good swing. Yeah. But if you're me and you don't want to play blast beats, then the swing pattern thing is essential. Yeah. You know, like it's like just kind of picking and choosing the ingredients that are going to make you the player that you want to be and not worrying so much about the great vat of options in front of you. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm going through this book right now called The Millionaire Success Habits by Dean Graziosi. And, uh, you know, one of the things he talks about in there is uh, a lot of people say work on your weaknesses. But if you sit there and work on your weaknesses, you know, you're not only will you take away from your strengths, but you may not have to even use those weaknesses for anything. So he says, focus on your strengths and make your strengths 10 times better because that weakness, you might not be able to get that to even the, the position where your main strength is, you know, right. and then you may not even have to use that kind of like you, you, the analogy you said, you know, yep. unless yeah, you're like agree, BT man. Bam and, and, and water. And there's like some, there's some qualifiers there. Like, like, especially when it comes to an instrument, like, yes, lean on your strengths, figure out who you are as an artist, as a musician, what you want to sound like, how you want to play and kind of derive things to practice based on that vision. But also like, if I just leaned on my strengths and didn't, even put any effort into my weaknesses well like then i wouldn't then i'd be playing in the same fills i was five years ago right yeah 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 like there's like there's a there's like uh how do i say it there's like weaknesses within your strengths right yeah yeah maybe those are the things to focus on yep exactly yep exactly and I think that's kind of what he's talking about. Maybe I didn't explain it so well, but, you know, but like you said, you find your lane. You're not going to go in, in the room after we get off the call and start working on blast beats because that's not, you know. <laughs> that's, like, do, do I wish I could do that <laughs> in some kind of vague way? Right. I mean, yeah. Like I watched, uh, I watched a drumio video of Alex Rudinger last night. Oh, okay. And that dude is such he's, a monster. He's ridiculous. He's and ridiculous. it's like, I can't play like that at all. Do I like those songs? Absolutely. But 
for where I am already, for the kind of lane I'm already going down, does it serve me to go buy a double bass pedal and start from zero? Like, or should I just like keep working on funky triplet stuff and displacing right. accents? Right, yeah. It's way more applicable to what I'm going for. Yeah, you know? yeah, for, yeah, for sure. sure. Um, so uh, we'll get to wrapping this thing up here. Uh, you know, I wanted to ask you, you know, what are some hacks, you know, for staying productive as a gigging band, assuming when you're going back to gigging and, you know, keeping, you know, keeping productive, you know, kind of wash away those days where maybe, you know, it's ups and downs. I think we all go through that, but just be able to keep that momentum forward. You know, what, what are some things you would say on that, you know, just to stay gigging all the time and. Do you mean as an individual or as a band? I, I would say as a band, you know, um, just say one of your bands, because I know you kind of spread that all over. But, you know, obviously you can you can look at it from any band that you play in. And Well, you know. one of the things we do in Flex, which is, again, in normal times, the, the busiest band, like the most gigs, um, we have an agenda for every rehearsal. And that might be this week. We're going to, we got to play a wedding this weekend. So this week, Wednesday, we're going to brush up on all those covers that we only perform and never really rehearse. And that's what we got to do. But say the following week, it's like, all right, we're playing a 50 minute set. That's going to be all originals. And we know them like the back of our hand. We don't feel like we have to rehearse, rehearse them. So this week is dedicated to there was that new baseline idea that we want to jam on. Let's see if we can figure out a bridge for that other tune. And we got to tighten up the outro to that other tune. And you just kind of lay it out in front of you and like make sure that you're using that rehearsal time um, in a way that's either attached to the upcoming gigs or if you don't really have much to prepare for, like saying specifically, okay, this rehearsal we're writing. Mm -hmm. Okay, this rehearsal, we're learning this cover. Um, and then in a, in a broader way, I guess it's just about like, I guess just, it's just kind of about that slow and constant incline um, where it could always be a little bit better. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and just kind of taking every show as it comes and then also like reflecting on what worked and what didn't and what was fun and what was a little rocky or where did the crowd really respond or is putting that song that late in the set list too exhausting to be play it sloppy because we put it too late in the set and just all of that kind of like constant fine tuning um and just, I just, I try, not, I don't always succeed at it, but I try to kind of look at the whole thing like top down or um, a great analogy is like, listen from the back of the room. Um, like put your mental space as an audience member. Mm -hmm. and, and like just kind of thinking about like where you're going and what you're doing and how it sounds and how it's affecting people and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, I don't know, the momentum is just, I love to perform. So if there's a gap in the calendar, I want to fill it. Yeah. And if uh, the people in whatever band don't want to, I'll find another gig. <laughs> there you go. That's simple, that. So, ladies and gentlemen, join 17 bands. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. If you didn't get exactly what he was saying, but that's what he's saying, so. Well, uh, I want to say thanks for uh, coming on the podcast, man. Like, I wish we could have kind of chilled and hung out in the same room, but hopefully we'll be able to do that soon. Uh, it's always a good time doing that, and maybe we'll have to do another one down the road when everything gets going, whenever it gets going. Who, who knows? Um, you know, usually I ask what's next. It's hard to say right now probably for you, huh, man? But what, what, what is in your mind? What, you know, what are you thinking, bro? You know, um, I've actually been thinking about that a lot. Uh, because I don't, we don't really know what the, the future for society at large holds, right? 
So I intend to not only just kind of double down on, I'm just going to practice, man. Like I just, I want to come out of this uh, the best musician I've ever been. Um, I want to experiment with some things that I normally wouldn't in some kind of hustle and bustle. I've been doing that a little bit with weird setups and stuff, but uh, I've got this sample pad behind me that oh, I like, there never go. really mess with. Nice. Like, that I need to spend some time gathering sounds for. And I've got a guitar behind me that I don't know how to play. <laughs> <laughs> stuff like that. And then um, unrelated to music entirely, uh, I've been, I'm six deep now of these like micro fiction series. And I haven't really been doing any fiction writing much at all in the last maybe 10 years. And that has been really fun to get back into and another angle of creativity to explore. Um, so I also want to take all this time in my house without late nights, without travel to like kind of reconnect with being a creative writer. Okay. Nice. Super dope. Yeah. Um, so uh, how do we get a hold of you, man? You know, if you want people to get a hold of you, if that's, you know, something that you want to do, how, how do we look at your videos? And, uh, yeah, you know, what... uh, I have the good fortune of forever ago, I think in the, like, some of the early social media, uh, I have claimed Mux Mike, M-U-X-M-I-K-E, on every social that's my Gmail, that's my Twitter, that's my Instagram, that's my Facebook, like everywhere. M-U-X-M-I-K-E uh, is always me on the internet. Hell yeah. Um, what about uh, bands? Obviously, the Flex new record. How can we listen to that? Um, There's, uh, that's on Spotify. If you want to buy it, which would be rad, is on Bandcamp, just flexdecibel.bandcamp.com. Um we have enough material just about for another short hair record, but I don't know when we're going to be able to record that. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, even if you just kind of uh, look at any of my own, especially my personal Facebook, there's like the page links for all the stuff I'm involved in. And I'm kind of constantly posting about the various things that I'm doing. Right. Yeah, makes sense. So follow you and uh, get in touch with all your music. Like I said, kudos on the Flex record. I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I uh, those two standout tracks really hit my soul. So I appreciate you writing um, tunes like that. And tell them guys, kudos to them when you talk to them. But uh, appreciate your time, man. And I will uh, talk to you soon, hopefully. See you out and about. And uh, I'll yeah. let you know when this is dropping. And I'll put some links below, too. Okay, cool. Let me know so, if uh, you need anything else from me. Yeah, no worries. So... Thank you guys for uh, checking out the podcast. Check out Mux Mike. Uh, and uh, appreciate y'all. Much love. See you, dude. Thanks so much, man. Yeah, no yeah, worries. No worries. Later. 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 Later.